We're going to begin with Sarah Murray. Sarah is a doctoral candidate at the Balsoli School of International Affairs who is working on global justice and human rights. And she's going to tell us a little bit about uh, some perspectives around this, this uh, the, how IHL actually applies to, to persons with disabilities. So without further ado, I'll, I'll give the floor to Sarah. Welcome, Sarah, and please, please proceed with your presentation. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna take a moment to share my screen. All right, so um, I'm going to present a very brief overview of international law and norms for people with disabilities in armed conflict. This presentation will address both international humanitarian law, um, which is I will refer to as IHL, as well as international human rights law, which I will refer to as IHRL. Uh, and I'm going to explain some of the ways they work together for people with disabilities in conflict situations. Uh, I realize our keynote speaker covered some of this in her presentation last night, so please forgive any repetition. Uh, people with disabilities are uniquely and disproportionately affected by conflict. They are subject to targeted killings and women and girls with disabilities are at a greater risk of sexual and gender-based violence. When fleeing conflict, people with disabilities are not always considered in evacuation plans, so they lack the necessary support to leave the area. When people with disabilities do reach a protected area, they may be unable to access adequate humanitarian aid because they require special accommodations. For example, people with disabilities may require unique medical care that may not be available in displacement camps. IHL and IHRL provide us with the legal foundations to address the unique difficulties people with disabilities experience in armed conflict. So first I'll talk a little bit about humanitarian law. Uh, people with disabilities have all of the same protections guaranteed under international humanitarian law as anyone without a disability. Uh, there are also several references to people with disabilities in IHL. So the Geneva Conventions and protocols call for special facilities for people with disabilities and special care for and evacuation of prisoners of war with disabilities. As well, several articles call for the protection and accommodation of people with disabilities in transport and evacuation processes. The Geneva Convention uses language, um, I must say, that is now considered outdated and offensive to describe people with disabilities. IHL treaties use the terms infirm, wounded and sick, and disabled rather than persons with disabilities. And IHL also refers to people with psychosocial or intellectual disabilities as having a mental disease. While the terminology was a product of its time, this does not detract from the fact that already in 1949 and in 1977, people with disabilities were recognized as requiring protection under IHL. This reflects an acknowledgement of their specific needs and the barriers they may face, as well as the risk they are exposed to in their armed conflict environment. Today, practitioners of IHL adopt a human rights-based model of looking at disability and employ a contemporary interpretation of IHL where people with disabilities are seen as agents of their own destiny. Uh, contemporary humanitarian organizations are considering the unique needs of people with disabilities. So for an example, the 31st International Conference of the Red Cross and Red Crescent reaffirmed the obligation to take the specific needs of people with disabilities into account in the planning, delivery, and monitoring of humanitarian assistance efforts. This includes access to shelter, water, sanitation, food distribution, physical re rehabilitation, transportation, communication, and socioeconomic inclusion programs. Sorry, there was a many list. <laughs> Additionally, they called for consultation with people with disabilities in all relevant stages of planning and implementation. Uh, so in addition to IHL, there are several other international agreements and mandates which address people with disabilities during conflict. So the most significant is uh, the Human Rights Treaty, uh, the UN, United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, also known as the CRPD. Uh, it's been ratified in 182 countries and explains human rights in the context of disability, clarifying how to protect and promote the human rights of people with disabilities. Article 11 of the CRPD reaffirms that states are, uh, have obligations under IHL and IHRL to ensure the protection and safety of people with disabilities during armed conflict. In a sense, it calls for the two sets of international law to be meaningfully aligned in this situation. The UN principles on internal displacement also affirm that people with disabilities are entitled to respect and protection. Under the guiding principles, uh, principle four, 
Internally displaced people with disabilities must be given protection and support in accordance with their needs. National authorities have the responsibility to ensure that internally displaced people have basic rights to food, water, shelter, dignity, and safety, and they need to facilitate their access to all other rights. It also requests that states accept the assistance of the international community when they do not have the capacity to provide assistance and protection to civilians. Uh, finally, in 2019, the UN Security Council unanimously adopted Resolution 2475. This resolution acknowledges the disproportionate impact of armed conflict and related humanitarian crises on people with disabilities. It also reminds states of the overall responsibility of parties to armed conflict to protect civilians. It recalls the universality of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all people. It also recognizes the importance of contributions by people with disability to conflict prevention, reconstruction, peace building, and addressing the root causes of conflict. The resolution also notes the particular barriers faced by people with disabilities in accessing justice. Uh, it is actually the first standalone resolution on the protection of people with disabilities. So now I'm going to talk about uh, some of the ways in which the CRPD, um, the foremost human rights treaty on disability, and IHL work together in the protection of people with disabilities. So the CRPD and IHL are intended to be complementary to one another. The CRPD is unusual among human rights treaties in that it explicitly invokes humanitarian law alongside human rights law. The CRPD does not contain a derogations clause which means that there is no possibility for states to suspend application of the convention during states of emergency or armed conflict. Instead, it affirms that the rights of people with disabilities continue to apply during armed conflict and that these rights exist alongside IHL. Um, however, I will say that when considering the relationship between IHL and the CRPD, um, you must take into account the realities of armed conflict. So the CRPD will not always be implemented in times of conflict exactly as it is in peacetime, nor would any other human rights treaty. Interpretation of states' obligations within the CRPD needs to be adapted to the realities of the armed conflict setting. However, the interpretation must remain in compliance with the fundamental purpose of the rights in question. The CRPD's principle of non-discrimination is echoed in IHL in the prohibition of adverse distinction. So IHL prohibits unfavorable discrimination based on race, gender, nationality, religious belief, political opinion, or any other similar criteria. At the same time, a distinction may be made to give priority to those in most urgent need of care. Uh, it has been decided that disability falls under the any other similar criteria section. So a brief example, IHL provides that people with disabilities must receive prioritized attention if their health condition or the risk of losing access to health services is more urgent than that of other people or groups. IHL also contains specific obligations equivalent to the CRPD obligations related to mobility and availability of assistive technologies for prisoners of war and civilians. Any apparatus needed for the maintenance of good health is supposed to be supplied to people with disabilities free of charge. Uh, these rules uh, can also be considered as IHL equivalents to the CRPD obligations on positive discrimination and accessibility. IHL fills the gaps that the CRPD has regarding conflict. All parties to an armed conflict, whether states or non-state actors, are bound by international humanitarian law. In contrast, the CRPD binds only those states that are party to it and cannot bind non-state actors. Therefore, IHL may further prevent or minimize harm to people with disabilities in armed conflict. Appreciating the complementary and mutually reinforcing nature of IHL and the CRPD will help us better operationalize protection of people with disabilities in humanitarian activities. So to conclude, uh, from these brief examples, we can see that between IHL and IHRL, there are clearly a number of legal considerations and protections for people with disabilities in conflict situations. However, the challenge of applying these laws in conflict situations remain. So for example, Human Rights Watch has recently claimed that their research shows that people with disabilities and situations of armed conflict have faced violent attacks, forced displacement, and ongoing neglect in the humanitarian response to civilians. A first step to improve the on the ground application of IHL and IHRL is to include people with disabilities in the planning and implementation of humanitarian assistance.
Uh, thank you very much for your time. And I hope that this presentation has provided you with some new information. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. It certainly provided new information for me. I think it's, it's very relevant and I'm glad that, that, that you uh, ended by referring to the importance of application, you know, on the ground, because that's where it matters at the end of the day. I mean, the, uh, not to repeat myself, but I will. I mean, the, the, the existence of the norms themselves is highly, highly positive, but another highly, positive, highly important part of this equation is the way in which those norms have, are actually implemented. And that's where the, the difference can actually be made. So thank you very much for that.